a both days with uh, 31 days in the month, but it's also the case that there are weekends when people don't work, that there are holidays when people don't work. There's actually a relatively benign explanation to this. And overbilling definitely happens in Pakistan's electricity system, but this is not how you do it. And the reason is that if in one month I bill you for 35 days in cons consumption, then the next month, so long as I'm actually reading the meter, then it has to be for 25 days or less. So a lot of the problem is that there is a power ministry, there is NEPRA. Who is responsible for the sector? Is NEPRA regulating the sector? The power secretary re regulating the sector? In fact, I've donors that showed the a long time ago, ADB and the World Bank used to insist that the tariff should be announced by the NEPRA. Yeah. But now it's still announced by NEPRA. So the question is, the deeper governance issue is, Kiji, are we really, do we really have a power system? I mean, you're going to talk to these petty bureaucrats, etc. Fair enough. But what independence do they have? Another thing that I noticed, and Shah Sahib, you can confirm it, that all DISCO funds are sent to the finance, uh, to power ministry immediately. They don't keep any funds. They can't take any funds vis a vis. They can't take any decisions vis a vis updating their infrastructure or doing better stuff. All these decisions are taken by the power sector. Do you see that as a problem? Because we said that it's a big problem. This is a map of DISCO losses in 2022. Uh, based on the NEPRA statistics. So what you'll see the map on the left, what it shows you is the transmission and distribution losses. So the definition of transmission and distribution losses is electricity that is supplied, but not billed, right? So it goes out into a system, into the electricity system, but nobody gets a bill for it. We try to keep a series of Pakistan in a webinar series conferences ki series jari rakhe taaki hamare logon ko khas taur pe hamari academia should wake up to a conversation that needs to be developed in pakistan right now all universities exist in silos all groups exist in so called elite silos we've got the punjab club gym khana of um, academia if there is an academia which i doubt so we try to get people to tell people who have written something, who have done something, so that we can learn from This is a tradition that has prevailed in the West, and that's why they rule. This is a tradition that prevails in Israel, that's why they rule. So today, we have seen a new book. I think it's been a year or two, but a new book is Access to Power, Electricity and the Infrastructural State in Pakistan. Ijlal Naqvi is a young academic who has uh, written this book and has got a um, position now in Singapore. So he's doing very well in Singapore. As we've talked about this in Pied very often, we are a talent repellent country. We don't like to use our own talent. We send it away. So Islal is part of the brain drain. And quite frankly, I tell Pakistani youngsters that you run away from here. There is no need for talent. But that's beside the point. That's subject of another um, webinar. Abhi toh hum baat karenge access to power, electricity. So, Ijlal sahab hume batayenge inki kitab ka hume introduce karenge and hopefully we'll read the book too. I've got a copy of the book. Just started to look at it. Ijlal sahab, over to you. I will read your book later, but I'll learn from you. Ki kya hua? Actually, I've seen most of it, I read most of it, but thank you, Nadeem Saab. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics for, for inviting me, for giving me a chance to share my work and for, for running a, a seminar series so that uh, uh, research on Pakistan can be uh, shared and enjoyed like this. Um, so this uh, talk is primarily about uh, my book, which was published in 2022, but it was just released in Pakistan. So you can buy a copy uh, um, at Oxford University Press and other bookstores. Um, and uh, the PDF is available for uh, a download via the Oxford University Press site, uh, which is open access and therefore um, without cost. Um, and this is work that I've done over the past 10 to 15 years uh, through regular trips to Pakistan and an extended period of field work here as well. So the brief outline of what I'll be discussing today, although the talk is primarily about my, my, my book and my research, I wanted to bring it to some relevance about a very topical issue, which is the NEPA report on overbuilding, which came out very recently, which was also covered 
uh, covered in the newspapers and a topic of some discussion. And I want to use that as a starting point for thinking more generally about some of the challenges of the Pakistani electrical power sector, um, and then give you a little bit of uh, my analysis, which I called infrastructural state, which is how I uh, would like to encourage you as a useful way to think through some of these challenges of state capacity of what governments can and can't do in Pakistan. And this, um, uh, I find that it's useful to look at multiple levels of analysis. It looks different at the national level from the city, from the individual. And this brings uh, uh, us to the idea of governance, which the argument of the book says uh, is an uh, emergent compromise. Um, that's what we'll go through today. So the the problem, so to speak, like this, uh, this research started from an awareness of a basic problem in Pakistan that we desperately want to meet electricity demand. But but we don't. Uh, typically, we don't. And this is despite the fact that electricity is almost always at the top of the political agenda. You see, if there's a new prime minister, they will always talk about electricity in their inaugural speech. Um, estimates are that it reduces annual GDP growth by 2%. Uh, that's an approximate number, but it still gives you a sense of the scale of the challenge. Uh, all foreign assistance over many years, uh, all the foreign donors have been involved in um, giving substantial amounts of money to the electricity sector. Uh, to try and uh, rectify its problems. And it's the subject of massive popular dissatisfaction, which this audience will know uh, all too well. Okay, to start with, to discuss a little bit the overwhelming report put out by NEPRA. So one of the things they talked about was that people were getting bills over 30 days. You're supposed to get a bill based on a reading every 30 days. And some of these bills were taken uh, with readings that were longer uh, than 30 days. As it happens, July and August, uh, are both days with uh, 31 days in the month, but it's also the case that there are weekends when people don't work, that there are holidays when people don't work. There's actually a relatively benign explanation to this, and overbilling definitely happens in Pakistan electricity system, but this is not how you do it. And the reason is that if in one month I bill you for 35 days in cons consumption, then the next month, so long as I'm actually reading the meter, then it has to be for 25 days or less. So oh, when overbilling happens, you have to do it in a different way. And typically, that might be sort of, for example, a bill is registered, which is then written off as a bad debt. Um, there's a famous example from Lesco in 2012, which was caught by Lesco's internal audit. So, I mean, that's why we know about it, because it was caught uh, and written up. Um, and, uh, you know, it was for billing that was written as bad debt. So it looks like bills were being issued, but actually no money was being collected. And that relationship between billing and money and collection is something that's crucial to understanding the, the power sector. The second thing that the NEPRA report mentioned was talk about defective meters. Here again, um, there's a relatively benign explanation in the fact that MEPCO, which is the chief culprit in Multan, um, they were unable to uh, procure the meters that they needed, largely because they couldn't open a letter of credit. And this uh, is the explanation provided by Rashid Langrial, Secretary Power. Um, and I certainly don't have any further insight than that. But this kind of experience is relatively, it's not unusual um, that uh, the, the discos don't actually have access to sufficient material uh, to do the work as it needs to be done. And so there's an example of this, which also comes from the report, which is all about the use of handheld units uh, versus mobile phones uh, to do meter reading. So when I was uh, studying the power sector in Pakistan, I would follow meter readers around to uh, see how they did their work and they would note it down on a little notebook. And then when they get back to the office, they would copy it up. So using a phone or a handheld unit is great because uh, meter reading to Hotia, then they will be automatically uploaded to their system. And that's very nice. And it, you can combine it with the, uh, a photo of the picture to give some kind of accountability, so long as, of course, the photo is properly taken. But the, the key point here comes from 5.4. So there's the NEPRA uh, complaint is that handheld units should be used because they're superior. But what they acknowledge is that the, the staff have a phone, so there's no additional cost for the device itself. But the caveat, of course, is that the disco isn't paying for the phone. That's the personal phone of the employee. The disco isn't providing this equipment. The disco is not providing the crucial equipment that is necessary for the employees to do their basic work. You know, So if you think about it, that how the work is done at, as per rules, it requires a certain amount of the equipment to be provided. Disco doesn't do it. In the same way, it doesn't have an adequate supply of transformers. In the same way, it doesn't have an adequate supply of vehicles. So when staff need to be out of the office and traveling around to the sites where work is done, 
they have to provide that transport themselves. If there is a vehicle, it typically doesn't have sufficient petrol allowance. So how is the petrol paid for? When work is done, where are the tools coming from? Basic tools like axes, shovels, things like this. There often are, the cost has to be borne by the employee uh, who also doesn't get any safety equipment, um, which typically isn't worn. Um, and, and that way they, they have to make up their money in some way. If the place worked as per rules, nothing would actually happen. I'm gonna talk a little more generally about the power sector, why it matters uh, this much. So this, uh, what this graph shows is that electricity uh, generation growth and GDP growth basically go hand in hand. Most people would say that it's a bi-directional relationship. That's not unique to Pakistan. But uh, as GDP grows, electricity will grow, and the availability of more electricity allows GDP to grow, so to speak. And when electricity is insufficiently available, it acts as a dampener uh, on growth. And there's never been a point in time in Pakistan's history when this relationship hasn't been understood and hasn't been a priority to try and solve this problem. Um, and so, however, capacity constraints have been an issue uh, for many, many years. And what the red lines show are these projections. The first ones are five-year plans, and then subsequently there are other sort of government plans that put out to say that how much electricity capacity will be added to the sector over time. And you can see there are only two points where the blue line is relatively close to the to the black uh, to the to the red line, and that is when um, uh, first uh, the IPPs in the mid '90s. Uh, and then CPEC uh, most recently. And that should also give you pause. It should make you worry because the IPP experience had long run consequences which were very damaging to the sector and still uh, remain the case. So what are we doing when we're expanding uh, capacity so uh, excessively that we then have to pay for it? So this brings us to a relationship which is very important. This is about the only bit of engineering in this presentation, but you have to differentiate between power versus energy. So power is an energy, a unit of energy over uh, in time. Um, and power is megawatts, but energy is megawatt hours, meaning that you have to basically run the power plant. You, you have to run the power plant, you have to run the engine in order for it to be of any benefit uh, to, the, to the consumers because it's producing a, a energy. And there are many points in Pakistani recent history when you cannot run the uh, power sector power plants, you have to keep it below capacity because we simply can't afford to pay for the power that is produced. And so this means, of course, load shedding when there isn't enough power uh, that is produced. This is uh, a table that came out of NEPR's performance evaluation report of the discos um, from 2022. So it, uh, uh, it summarizes the, the previous five years. Um, and so the point to take out here is that, you know, they're reporting load shedding. And as you can see in HESCO, it, the average is eight hours. You can imagine there's many times when it's much worse than that. And in PESCO, it's uh, six hours a, a day on average. But what NEPRA says for the remainder is that the figures are basically lies. They acknowledge that the discos are not appropriately reporting um, the load shedding that they carry out because they know it's happening, but they can't, um, uh, but they can't account for it because the, the discos aren't reporting to them honestly. So this idea that rules lie at the heart of governance is problematic because what we're seeing is that even the regulator is acknowledging that they get false information that is given to them. So to bring this together, this chart is important because it links generation transmission and distribution to cash flow, and cash flow is crucial here. So the power that is generated is sent out through the system, then distributed through the distribution companies who have to then collect money. So when losses are excessive or bills aren't paid, someone has to bear that uh, cost, and that someone is the government, uh, and it may be contributing through subsidies, or it may be contributing through other forms of fiscal transfer. So basically, this is the origins of circular debt that the government is accumulating um, arrears and trying to cover for them so that generation can continue. Otherwise, the electricity sector would shut down. And uh, when those subsidies and transfers get excessive, then that's when we enter a state of crisis, which regularly happens. But is Pakistan so terrible in the context of other developing uh, countries? And the answer is no. In terms of losses, actually, we're close to the line of best fit that's taken across uh, um, you know, this, this graph of uh, electricity losses against uh, GDP per capita. You can compare us to other countries in the region, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. You see, we're not so far away. We also fit in where you might expect. But Pakistan's actually improved since uh, the data for this graph was, was provided. Um, and, and you see that uh, 
Pakistan's example and experience is relevant to other countries uh, in a similar level of development. To explain this, I want to bring you to this idea of the infrastructural state, which is a theoretical framework that I developed um, in the book, um, should you have the chance to, to read it. So this, uh, there's a couple uh, different aspects of this. First, to critique the dominant paradigm, which uh, applies to this kind of uh, development work. Um, and then to, to make uh, three interventions, which help us, I think, understand the topic uh, in, a, in a better manner. Firstly, uh, to see the state uh, as a series of nested fields. And I'll, I'll talk about what that means. But it is very much the case that uh, what happens at a lower level of analysis affects um, the higher level of analysis as well. So um, then I'll talk briefly about why we use material infrastructure as a way of studying the state in this manner. And lastly, the point that Pakistan works. But of course, for whose benefit is the question that must follow. So this quote comes from the Institute of Development Studies. They did a, a big review of government reforms that were being you know, funded by the World Bank and other development agencies. And the point that they came to was that governance reforms routinely fail. And the reason for their failure is a focus on formal rules. The idea being that governance is largely a function of institutions. Institutions are shaped by their formal rules. So we fix the rules and therefore we can improve governance. And this doesn't work because it's an approach which privileges a counterfactual, i.e. that like we're comparing Pakistan to Denmark or some other idealized other. And we say, if our rules were only like that, we would be better too. But that takes us away from what's actually happening and why. So why does Pakistan in the work in the way that it does and to whose benefit? So this idea of the state as nested fields, nested in terms of like Russian dolls, one within each other, the nation, the city, the individual. Um, and each field is an arena of conflict. So this is a little different to the idea of institutions based on, on rules, formal and informal, because you bring power into it, right? So it's conflict that we are fighting for what we want. People make actions based on seeking their own advantage within this uh, uh, environment. We know what's at stake. We know what each other's relative positions are. And we know what's permissible and feasible. And so that means that the order that emerges from this, right, it has has an organic quality and it can't be predicted from before because it is the, pr the product of these conflicts at different levels. So then this point of studying uh, this system through the lens of material infrastructure. Here, this is a built infrastructure that I'm talking about. Um, and I draw heavily on the work of Thomas Hughes, uh, who wrote a book called Networks of Power in 1983. And here, uh, the idea is that electrical power systems are both cause and effect of social change. They've been built up with the physical resources, the intellectual resources, and the symbolic resources of the society that makes them. If you think about Vakta in mid 20th century Pakistan, it was a modernizing project. We were bringing electricity to the people. And you can see that in the symbolism that was used around the time. Um, and it's very clear that uh, electricity has this sort of modern quality that to bring it is to, to do a nation building service as well. Um, and uh, these, uh, it, the idea is that, you know, we have to understand this material infrastructure, not just as a technical set of challenges, but within this larger context. And the example of Thomas Edison building the very first electricity distribution system is instructive here because Edison, you know, he, he doesn't invent a, a light bulb, he improves it. But he, what he does is he lays out a system for generating and distributing electricity. His first connection in Manhattan is to Drexel, Morgan and Company, the Wall Street financiers. And that's important because obviously they're a rich client, but they're also an influential client, right? Edison knew that the people who had to buy into this system were then going to be his supporters. And there's a materiality which is important here. And by that, I mean that electricity has particular characteristics, which are different from rail, which are different from water, which are different from roads. Each one of those is a material infrastructure that builds out a nation. But electricity is special because it annihilates distance. That with electricity, the entirety of this grid must be connected and running together. It must be in sync. That one of the qualities of the grid is that you have to maintain the frequency at which it operates, which is a characteristic that has to be managed across the entirety of the system. And in, in Pakistan's case, it's a single grid across the entire country. And that brings us back to this idea of Pakistan works. And I want us to think of the absence of the state, or sorry, the unevenness of the state, the different degree to which is it effective across the country is not absence, it's 
a, it indicates the manner in which the different parts are brought into the whole. And this is inequality by design, a term used by Catherine Boone, meaning that it's the result of strategic decisions that each one of those sort of strategic conflicts that's happening produces certain outcomes, right? Which makes you ask that Pakistan works, but to whose benefit, right? And then what's happening here is the reproduction of relations of domination. So what did I do? I was uh, to study this is chiefly based on field work that I did in Islam about between 2008 and 2011 um, and regular subsequent research trips to develop some of these ideas and take the time to write the book as well. So I talked to everybody that I possibly could, the lowest level utility employees, uh, mid-level utility employees, managers and so on, senior bureaucrats, all manner of people with responsibility for power sector planning, regulation and implementation of those policies as well. I talked to consumers of all stripes, steel mill owners, commercial plaza, people running shops, domestic consumers from, you know, uh, big mansions in F6 to Kachibadis. Most of this work was done in Islamabad, uh, but some also a little bit in the Lahore area as well. Um, and I also worked as a USAID consultant based at the Ministry of Water and Power in 2011. All right, so what does this look like at the national level? So at the national level, the question or, you know, if you ask, what is this a case of? There's a general question that's being addressed here by studying electricity. And it's about infrastructural power or state capacity, meaning what can a state effectively do when a state makes decisions? Can it penetrate its territory to implement those decisions effectively. And so I'm using losses, I'm really focusing on transmission and distribution losses um, as, a, as a manner of sort of examining the uneven way in which the state does penetrate its territory to implement decisions around, in this case, providing electricity and getting people to pay for it. So there is a, a subset of these which are technical losses, essentially resistance in electrical wires, you might consider it to be around 3%. Um, but average uh, transmission distribution losses across Pakistan are about 20% in 2015. I mean, I put in that number because it went below 20%, and it's been reducing since then to 16.7% in 2022. Uh, so that's uh, what we usually call losses or transmission distribution losses, but commercial losses are a little bit different in that they take into account recovery. So it allows you to differentiate when a bill is actually paid as opposed to um, when it's issued. So... Uh, these are the, this is a map of disco losses in 2022 uh, based on the NEPRA statistics. So what you'll see the map on the left, what it shows you is the transmission and distribution losses. So the definition of transmission and distribution losses is electricity that is supplied but not billed, right? So it goes out into a system, into the electricity system, but nobody gets a bill for it um, for multiple reasons, but chiefly theft um, is, is what we would say. And you can see how it's primarily the distribution companies in the Punjab, which have a better performance of maybe 10%, 14% from EPCO, um, that are losses. That is the electricity that is not billed. But in other parts of the country, it's significantly worse, um, particularly PESCO, SEPCO, et cetera. Um, and the tribal areas, Tesco looks, or formal tribal areas, sorry, uh, looks comparatively good in the map on the left, but that, if you think about it, that bills are being issued, but they're certainly not being paid. So if you look at Tesco's performance, uh, once you factor into the, fa uh, the account that no one is paying those bills, it's like 79% of the electricity that is sent out in Tesco is neither billed nor paid. And so if you see the map on the right, now what this is showing you is that of the proportion of uh, people who are actually paying for electricity consumption, the vast majority uh, of that uh, is in the Punjab, where you see a level of performance which is quite different from elsewhere. And I think I want to take a moment to point out AJK and Gilgit Baltistan because they sit in this peripheral position within the Pakistani state and they're excluded from uh, the, the usual electricity system. And there is something in that in, in terms of their actual um, standing and position within the, the state itself, somewhere, somewhere on the side and not fully incorporated into the terms of citizenship of Pakistan. So uh just wanted to show you a few pictures of what these sites look like so this is gomal zum which is a small hydroelectric project in uh south waziristan so i flew out there uh to see uh this project while it was being constructed and you can see the land is um you know uh you, the land is very dry it's very brown um and the water that's uh captured in this reservoir would do a lot in terms of irrigation uh, to benefit uh, that area. You can see this is the dam site under construction. There's a Chinese flag there 
um, uh, for the the Chinese company that was working um, uh, on the construction project, uh, funded by USAID, incidentally. And sort of left and right of this picture uh, are a lot of soldiers keeping security at this particular site. Um, it was difficult. This was a place where um, some engineers were kidnapped, work had to be interrupted, there were difficulty in payments. It took a long time for this project, uh, for the dam itself to be uh, completed. And here it is from the other side, uh, where you can see this uh, roller compacted concrete dam um, that uh, it does a number of different things. When it's capturing water at the back, then that can be released for irrigation. It can be released. When it is released, it, it generates power. And it also serves for flood control, which was particularly important in the floods of uh, around 2010. Another big source of electricity, at least historically, has been the bloach gas reserves. So this example is worth highlighting because of the recurrence of insurgency uh, in Balochistan. And here I want to link these two things specifically because electricity infrastructures in Balochistan are a target of insurgent action because they see it as an extractive function of the state from which from whose benefits they are excluded. And you can see you know um, they feel aggrieved in terms of uh, royalty payments, but it's uh, linked to uh, missing persons cases and others that the I can't do justice to uh, the experience of Balochistan um, on one slide. But I want to point out that the experiences of Balochistan with respect to electricity, and you would have seen on the map that basically electricity bills are not collected, uh, that um, it's tied to their broader experience of uh, participation in the policy of Pakistan. So this is Jamshoro uh, Thermal Power Station. It's an older one. I don't think it's actually functional anymore. Um, its experience uh, uh, was difficult for many years because it was built to work on natural gas, but when the natural gas became less available, it was switched to furnace oil, which is both filthy, polluting, and expensive. It destroys the machinery from inside because of the high sulfur content. And there was a project later on to try and uh, uh, you know renovate it, so to speak, uh, that was largely unproductive because it was always too expensive to run. And that was a major problem with the use of furnace oil from which we have uh, switched away um, in later years. So this power plant is a much more recent one. This was actually the first uh, big power plant of the CPEC uh, era. Uh, this is a uh, Saival, Saival coal-fired power plant. Um, the scale is not easy to pick up, but you can see that tall chimney from perhaps almost 10 kilometers away uh, on the GT road. And this picture is taken from the GT road driving south uh, towards the facility. And those buildings in the foreground, in, in sort of in the middle point there, the red and white striped buildings, those are perhaps six or seven stories high. And that tall chimney is about 150 meters uh, high. It's the tallest thing around for about 500 miles. This, thing, this facility is simply massive. And as you drive up to it, it looks extraordinary and somewhat out of place. Um, and one of its oddities is that coal needs to be brought a thousand kilometers inland from Karachi to service this uh, power plant, uh, uh, which is a, a very unusual arrangement uh, for a coal-fired power plant to be so distant from its uh, source of fuel. Um, but it was built at record speed. It does exactly what it was supposed to in terms of generating uh, a power um, at a far more efficient rate than the plant that we were just looking at, which is one of the sorts of plants that were replaced by product, by, by Saiwal coal. Um, and you could think of you know, the ability to produce that power plant, to build that power plant as being indicative of state capacity, but it is not, at least not our state capacity. This is a billboard within the Saiwal plant. Um, and the, it's talking about the Saiwal spirit, but the first thing it says, that first line is, the patriotic spirit of being loyal to the party and winning glory for the country. And it's talking about the effort, the tremendous effort of building this plant. But as the Chinese Mandarin text would indicate to you, uh, it's not uh, necessarily this country or any Pakistani party that is being uh, alluded to. Okay, so this fits within a larger idea of Pakistan, a singular idea, a unitary national identity. Um, and as my friend Omer Javed has written, it's talking about a primary axis of conflict and contention of the state or center versus peripheral regions. And you can see the tensions that exist across those, uh, uh, um, uh, across the sort of center state um, difference. You can see them, they've been expressed in religious terms, in ethnic, 
uh, uh, terms, uh, language policy, uh, uh, very famously, um, and also in terms of electricity. What that map shows, in a way, is the different degrees to which these regions are incorporated into the Pakistani state. And uh, the idea being that there is a single national entity, ide identity. I want to tie that also to the fact that all of the power produced in Pakistan is part of a common generation pool. And it's served at a singular tariff as well. So this idea of a unitary nation has uh, its um, direct analogs in electricity policy as well. Okay, so at the city level, this is the sort of level below the national, which I wanted to, to talk about. And I'm going to be focusing primarily on a Kachi Badi in Islamabad. So uh, this is not the Kachi Badi, this is the old city in Lahore, old city in Itra. You can see this is a lot of what wiring and infrastructure looks like for above ground wiring. Um, to be fair, not all of that jumble is electricity wires. A lot of it is uh, sort of unlicensed cable uh, TV operators who will put up wires anywhere and everywhere, but they make the entire system far more difficult to maintain and operate, and they create danger in doing so. Um, but this is the famous kunda, uh, or the hook, um, and this is from a street in Liari, uh, where I took these pictures of, you can see how uh, it's extremely simple to do, uh, in, and it just takes a twisted wire to hook onto the live overhead uh, um, conductor. Um, half a 7-Up bottle or something will be cut and attached to this wire, which then with a broomstick or other wooden pole, you can hook up to the line. It's very simple to put up. It's easy to put down if you go about it and make the effort, but then by the next day, these lines will be up again. Um, uh, however, it's worth saying that these are so visible, so obvious, that they're often hard to maintain without some other kind of arrangement in place. That might be a payment that involves police, it involves the staff of the distribution company, or it might be basically the kind of environment where police and uh, distribution company staff are afraid uh, to uh, make inroads into sort of correcting uh, uh, the, the Kunda culture uh, because they fear for their own safety uh, against the political powers that back the operation of this kind of arrangement. So this is uh, this is a plaza in, um, in Islamabad uh, in F10 uh, from a few years ago. I'm sure they've cleaned up that rubbish by now, but the point that I wanted you to look at is the, the, the distribution box because Islamabad, where I did a lot of my field work, is actually the very best of all of the distribution companies in many respects, but most especially uh, in terms of the underground um, electricity distribution system, which exists at least within the Islamabad circle. Um, and this distribution box is where underground connections are joined and then they go to the, to the neighboring areas. And here's one in a residential area that was around my neighborhood. The doors have a tendency to get stolen. Uh, never quite understood that, but I was told that somebody would sell them for scrap. Um, and this can create problems in terms of, you know, some vegetation growing through it or something like that. Um, but this underground system is a lot harder to hook into. It's very dangerous. And typically people don't uh, do it for multiple reasons. Um, so within this uh, larger sort of underground served environment, I was looking at Kachi Badis in Islamabad. And the residents of Kachi Badis are very interesting uh, because they're very aware of the problems of informality, the problems of sort of working with one kind of informal arrangement or another. They were the only people who talked about rights. They were the people who talked about rights and saying that they want the right to their land, the right to an individual meter, and that there are significant benefits that they will experience if they get those rights. And they were working very hard as a community, as a collective, through political connections and whatever else they could manage to try and get what they called regularization, which meant that every plot uh, will increase in value and they will be able to get uh, individual electricity connections. So there's a little bit of history there in that the area used to get electricity through Kunda connections um, from connecting to the wiring, and they would basically pay off the officials to look the other way. This is, this is a key thing about Kunda is that often it isn't free, right? You're still paying for it. You might not be paying the bill, but you're paying something. And did they think about it as theft? They said, no, you know, we would pay, but you won't let us take a connection. So uh, the, the phrase there is he's saying, uh, right? It's their right to electricity. And also they made a kind of moral claim 
And that was largely accepted by the utility officials with whom they negotiated, that these are humans, they have to have electricity in order to be able to live to some reasonable degree. And the solution that they came up with was a communal meter, meaning that there was one connection for the entirety of the Kachibadi, but they handled the distribution themselves. And this is fully against the distribution company uh, rules. You aren't able to sort of um, allow people to do that kind of work. Um, and they they did this uh, in sort of uh, a manner uh, largely dependent on sort of personal knowledge of the, the people who were there. And some people aren't charged the, the full amount. And they gave a lot more sort of flexibility in payments. Note that this doesn't always work well. Some of the Kachibadis were, the committee members were embezzling funds. That meant that the Kachibadi was in uh, uh, not paying its bills in full. Uh, but some of them were doing it uh, properly, including the one that I spent most of my time. So what happens is even as this is happening, they didn't achieve regularization while I was working with them. But one or two individuals would find a way to get a formal meter, right? But when they did this, some of them suffered. And this is the example of one young man who was telling me the story of his house. So he said they got this outlandish bill for 12,000 rupees, which you can imagine, you know, from 10 years ago, uh, the rupee was probably four times what it is now. Um, he could not explain this. They didn't have anything in their house that would consume so much electricity. And um, what he's complaining, uh, what he recognizes is that he doesn't have the personal capacity to negotiate with the disco staff in order to be able to get out of paying this bill. So what happens is he gets sort of stuck with it, but they re retreat. He doesn't cancel the formal meter, but he basically disconnects it. And then his family goes back to taking in electricity from the communal meter because they feel like they are less likely to be the subject of predation from the state, right? They're protected from the state's predation by uh, uh, being uh, going through a communal arrangement. Um, and this retreat from formality, Right, and I'm stressing formality here because formality here is linked to, linked to formal rules and the recipe for successful development. And so these people retreat from formality on a voluntary basis. And this happens in other spots too. There were some Kachibadi individuals who were who were resettled from their Kachibadi to F10. That's because the, the old Kachibadi area was redeveloped. But then they left it. They sold those plots and moved back to Kachibadis. What do you do? Right, they felt comfortable living in a Kachibadi. They knew how to manage their lives in that environment, and they were able to realize a substantial value from the sale of this plot. And these are people acting in what we can only assume is their own best interest. That they felt that they had other needs for that money, whether for their livelihoods, whether for schooling for their for their kids, or whatever they needed to do. The idea that formality is an automatic improvement over informality is somewhat complicated, and people voluntarily and consciously, strategically move across those lines. So I didn't only talk to Kachibadi people. This was a conversation with a steel mill owner. This is someone with a land, uh, a land Rover, this is someone with an MBA from the US. And what he's saying is that every relationship that he has with the government officers is about money, right? And he's, the, he makes a very interesting point here. He, he says he's not paying for things which are not permitted. He's paying for things. He's paying for his rights. He's paying for what he thinks of as his right to a high quality electricity service available when he needs it. Uh, this map uh, is not from my work in the Islamabad Kachiba. This is Karachi. This is Karachi's distribution area. And so what I'm showing you is uh, the results of uh, an econometric model um, from a different uh, paper, not part of the book either. But I wanted to show you this because I wanted to show you the kind of variation that exists across the city. I didn't have this kind of data for Islamabad, so it's useful to think about it uh, for uh, the Karachi context. And what you'll see is, for example, Clifton and Defense and certain other areas are performing much better in terms of losses uh, than some of the outlying areas in particular. But uh, this data set, which I got from Karachi Electric, has feeder level data. So at the higher level, right, each one of these blocks is um, 500,000 people or thereabouts. But here, now we're talking at a feeder level where there might be 1,500, 2,000 households in a feeder. So it's much more granular. And what you see by the, you know, the variation of the colors, you see purple next to orange. What's that showing you is that there's remarkably different sort of levels of loss performance in areas that are right next to each other. But I want to also stress that they're not just right next to each other. They're served by the same physical equipment. They're served by the same company with the same material infrastructure. Everything else is the same. The rule set is the same, but the performance in terms of losses and the way that the state can compel people to pay uh, is 
very different, even at this local level. And I should add an asterisk that obviously it's Karachi Electric, so it's not exactly the state. But I think uh, from from my work, I would definitely say that this is a pattern that holds true across other parts uh, of the country as well. So diving down in an even more granular level, this is the the, um, the area of Liari. Um, and what you can see is that the feeder is here will show you that pattern I was talking about, about very high and low performance right next to each other. And so this is a slightly older data. So Mutcher Colony is number one over there. Um, that's sort of like a, a famously poor area. Resident uh, Residents are, there's a high proportion of them who are sort of Bengali refugees, often without um, proper documentation. They struggle with the formal sector. There's a lot of really, really low wage informal sector employment. And that's an area where we kind of expect to have high losses. The, the story does change for Karachi Electric in that area later on, but uh, it's, uh, at this point in time, this is what they exemplify. And then you see a few other pair areas like number two is the West Wharf where you have all manner of sort of very formal sector organizations. So even within this very close uh, sort of environment, right, you see a great deal of variation. And the loss performance is very much driven by the people or organizations that are present within the area that's being served. It's not based on the company. It's not based on the material equipment. The rules are the same. Everything else is being held constant. But the people and the organizations that are being served is what is different. Okay, so at the individual level, uh, it's a different story. Um, or actually, it's a there's a story with a lot of parallels to what we see at the city and at the nation. So when you do business with any of the XWAPTA discos, uh, what you do is you show up in person. And you want things done, you have to be able to come to address the um, the staff, whether it's an ex, uh, XEN or SDO uh, or a line superintendent. Um, these requests are made personally. Uh, and the most common of them that I witnessed was sort of uh, bill repayments to be done in installments. These are usually granted. I used to ask why, why do you always allow them to pay in installments? And they said, well, we can't really chase them and it's better than uh, them not paying the thing uh, whatsoever. Um, so this is uh, again, to depart from the idea that formal rules are the essence of governance. It's like, no, your access to the formal rules is through the personal relationship of uh, the, uh, with your street level bureaucrat. And in what language, right? So in the areas where I did my field work, a range of languages being spoken, English, Urdu, Punjabi, and Pashto. But the only written language was English. And that's relevant because the rules are written in English. So the folks that work there, they are, uh, I mean, they certainly have some level of English education, but they're not referring to the rules in English. And neither are the consumers, frankly, right? So the rules are known, but they're not read. It's not a reference to the rules as a way of sort of compelling action. It's essentially in a foreign language to most of the people uh, who are either working there or there to get work done as consumers. So English has this particular role of symbolizing the authority of the state. And here, uh, Chima Saab, who was an extremely unpleasant character I used to encounter a lot in Islamabad, uh, what he would do was uh, sort of represent uh, influential people, go to the subdivision office and try and force through the work very quickly. So Baba, who was a line superintendent handling the new connections uh, uh, function, was trying to explain that if it was more than 20 meters from the existing infrastructure, then uh, he says, you know, I'm very sorry. But, you know, the first party says in Urdu, and the second party says in English. So what he's trying to do is sort of invoke the spirit of the rules that he can accommodate this. And Chima Asab is, is on him in a flash. He says, don't start your English with me, right? And he just tells Baba to do the work. He's intimidating, he's in his face, uh, and uh, he basically pushes Baba to do the work that he wants. And this is you know, the idea that you try and use the rules to push up against someone who's influencing you to try and do something one way or the other. And the rules aren't a great deal of support there. So in a different kind of environment, Baba would perhaps have the support of his superior officers to be able to enforce the rules against uh, Jima Saab, but he didn't feel confident of that uh, at that point in time, right? He didn't think that he would have the backing of uh, his, his leadership. So some conclusions, this idea of governance as an emergent uh, compromise. 
So how does a citizen secure service delivery? Actually, communal metering is uh, is quite common. Um, I mean, you get it in the Katir bodies that I talked about, but you see it elsewhere. Baria Town is effectively that. Baria Town manages its own metering. You see it in the naval colony in E7. It's another Islamabad example. That um, also in, in Model Town in Lahore, uh, that there are um, uh, collective ways to negotiate with the state that get you out of this sort of direct encounter with street level bureaucrats and they're often superior relationships for one of a number of reasons so what else can you do uh, uh the theft is an option um and but it usually happens with involvement of electricity electrical utility employees and the other thing to stress there is that theft usually happens with some kind of payment it isn't purely theft it's unbilled consumption yes but there's often a degree of payment that goes along with it through all of this, right, it's a very negotiated environment. This is an arena of strategic conflict. People are constantly jockeying for advantage, and they use whatever symbolic, monetary, other resources, including social networks and connections, that they can to get their advantage. And sometimes this spills over into violence, where I've seen uh, Wapta style assaulted, um, and uh, the threat of violence uh, used as a way to intimidate uh, uh, staff as well. So formality in this setting is not an unqualified improvement over informality. For consumers who have to sort of jockey for strategic advantage, if they themselves feel that as poorer people or as uneducated people, they are relatively weak, they can gain strength in numbers. This is a benefit of the communal metering. Um, and the, this boundary of formality and informality, people are making strategic decisions about household resources. It isn't necessarily the advantage, uh, you know, sort of a, 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 to, to have a formal relationship with the state, although it's clearly true that the wealthiest and best serves individuals do have formal relationships with the states, have formal metering arrangements as well. The point about the political economy at the provincial level, that in many governance reform programs, we act as if this isn't a crucial concern. But when you think about the former Fata or Balochistan, the subsidies for tube wells, the fact that Tesco people aren't paying uh, electricity bills or that uh, AJK bills are, are subsidized, it's like this is part of the way that the state has been pulled together. Um, and one of the consequences also is the tariff differential subsidy, which ties the nation together in a singular billing arrangement. And it's sort of a crude parallel with the sharing of generation resources uh, across the state. The argument that I'm putting forward is that electricity bills and the payment thereof becomes a proxy for understanding the social contract in Pakistan. So this position that governance is an emergent compromise, that uh, I'd say the core of the Pakistani state is weak in its rationality or legibility. Um, and it's constantly subject to subordination from concentrations of power among uh, individuals uh, and government agencies. Um, I see your hand shines up, but I'm almost at the end. So if you don't mind, I'll take questions in just a few moments. Um, uh, and this idea of formal rules existing, uh, uh, that formal rules certainly exist, but they cannot be accessed until and unless one also navigates the informal environment uh, around them. Okay, so what if I tried to give you an, inf an infrastructural lens on, on state building, meaning that you see it through the lens of material infrastructure. And this would be different if we're looking at other types of built infrastructure, such as rail or road, but I think we would be telling stories which have uh, uh, some aspects of similarity, and also for other aspects of public service as well, such as health and education. The unevenness that you see across the country, across cities, across individual experience is what I call an inequality by design. It reproduces relations of domination, and it is the outcome of strategic and conflictual actions among uh, the parties concerned. These relationships are nested one within the other, and the phenomena that we're most interested in are emergent and shaped from below. Formal institutions are always written from above, and there's very few ways for people to discipline the state from below. This is the chart I showed you about uh, the relationship between electricity and uh, uh, generation, that you have to, uh, it's a cash flow question, uh, and you have to maintain cash flows in order to be able to run this system um, effectively. This is the map about the variation in uh, uh, losses uh, across the country that you could use this. And I'm sure you would be nine tenths of the way there if you were going to compare 
uh, sort of outcomes in all manner of things like maternal mortality or sort of functional literacy uh, in, in in fifth class. Uh, this is uh, the map from Karachi, which shows the extraordinary degree of variation that exists at the city level. Right next to each other, we will find very differently performing environments. Um, and I'd say that this is where you see the best evidence of it being shaped from below, that the people and organizations of the place that is being served are so influential on the outcomes of interest. Right. This is the last thing I'm sharing. This is not my map. This was tweeted by Rashid Langriel. Uh, the Secretary Power just a few days ago, but he's showing you at a district level um, the variation in uh, losses um, that exist. And this particular map is important because the district is the level at which a lot of our administrative uh, concerns um, take place. And, and within this, you can see the vast degree to which there is a real difference in the terms of incorporation at the Pakistani state, where is, for example, losses are 90% and above uh, versus you know 5% or below huge differences that exist across this country. So this is from uh, the book, available in hard copy from uh, bookshops in Pakistan, uh, including the Oxford University Press. You can find a, a download from the Oxford University Press website. And if you have any thoughts or questions, please do uh, uh, contact me uh, via my e uh, email address. It's lalnakvi at smu.edu.sg. OK, um, thank you very much, Nadeem uh, That's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to. Pass it back to you as the moderator. I see one hand is already raised. Gee, Shahid Saab, go ahead. I have some questions. I'll reserve them. Go ahead, Shahid Saab. Gee, my question is uh, uh, very simply this, that uh, uh, tariff is being used by the uh, power division uh, to sort of equate poverty or for social obligations i.e they are charging uh, other sectors of the economy a far higher rate uh, and clearly say that it is a cross subsidy for example industries are paying about 11 rupees uh, towards uh, the domestic consumption so forth um, how do you view this as part of this uh, uh, social, uh, I mean, should that happen or is it something that, that is regularly happening in other countries? Thank you, Shahid Saab. Uh, it's nice to hear from you again. A uh, long time since we were being, uh, we've been in touch. Uh, uh, you asked, uh, should that uh, happen? I think that, I mean, it's a policy measure which has a uh, a justifiable uh, an argument that can be made to justify it. I mean, one doesn't have to endorse it. But the question really is, you know, for the poorest individuals, for them to be able to afford electricity, which they need for all manner of reasons, and which we want them to have, uh, they can't do it at full market rates. So one version of an argument for removing them, I've heard, is that the sort of uh, BISB income support program is a far superior way to give resources to support our poorest individuals and households within Pakistan. And so instead of giving this as a cross subsidy, give this kind of support through income support, and then the individuals can make up their own mind about how they how they use it. Um, but the, the cross subsidy is is quite, you know, consequential. Uh, people have talked for a long time about removing it. But I think here also the politics of the matter are important because to remove them is to put a great hardship on people who are already suffering. The protests, particularly, I mean, most recently in July and August, there were so many protests. They weren't about, you know, whatever NEPRA was reporting. They were about the cost of electricity, which was going up so hugely. There's a there's a real political consequence to this, but the, that political consequence is generated by the fact that people are suffering. You know, the cost of living is severe and electricity bills going up and up and up. Um, and so for governments, you know, one uh, answer to whether they should do it is that uh, there is a real need uh, to give people uh, the means to live well. Um, and one thing that happens when people aren't adequately connected to electricity is that they will chalk down any kind of flammable source that's nearby. You get deforestation as a result. You get uh, erosion that results. There are very negative consequences to excluding people from the grid. So it's a very thorny, difficult question. 
Um, but you know, some kind of support is clearly necessary, I would say. Uh, just a supplementary on this. The mm -hmm. issue is uh, very simply this, that by raising tariffs for your export sector, you mm -hmm. make them uncompetitive. Yeah. Once you make them uncompetitive, people lose jobs. Uh, then they can't afford even the low rates of electricity. The second part of this is that uh, Rashid Langreal, in a recent tweet, said, uh, you know, because of the failure of the state to collect taxation, this is, uh, you know, necessary. Uh, so uh, in order to keep uh, the tariffs lower for the domestic sector. Mm. Um uh, but I think it's a self-defeating uh, thing because uh, once uh, the jobs are lost, uh, it does not matter at what price the electricity is available. You're not wrong. The loss of jobs is uh, going to defeat the very kind of livelihood support and economic progress that we want to see achieved. But uh, the balancing of those two elements is uh, an essential component of uh, you know making these kinds of difficult uh, policy decisions, it's like it, it, the the challenge of ensuring that uh, people are able to meet their needs for livelihoods has its own importance and political salience. And just as the tariffs for uh, electricity consumption in the industrial sector um, is is a vital way of ensuring that our industries can function for all of the, the, the many reasons that that is uh, uh, crucial. So there's there's no answer to this question, which suggests that uh, you should overcharge industries or that you should not help people have a, a decent way to live. The question of cross subsidy, and we should talk about it. Afia, go ahead. Uh, I don't have a question, but a small comment. Uh, yeah. When we talk about uh, the uh, discourse, what we can see is we need to keep politics away from the power distribution sector. Power division manages electricity, but they don't have the professional management and they have limited technical understanding at that. I think that's the main problem uh, which is affecting the whole sector. So what all what we need is the commercialization of these distribution companies and uh, empower those distribution companies to make their own decisions. And once they are empowered, all these problems of theft and um, um, the recoveries issue, and these all will be resolved. And uh, by keeping politics away, I mean, but uh, just add to what uh, Shahid Satar Saab was saying, um, this tariff subsidy is the basic problem. It should be removed, and uh, the direct subsidy is the main solution. So decentralization of uh, 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 power and make these companies more accountable and more responsible for all the decision makings, and the removal of this tariff differential subsidy and charge each consumer category as per their cost of service. That's the uh, basic way to go forward. And. Uh, <laughs> Hmm. जो हमारा thesis I don't know whether you've seen our work or not. Normally, hmm. uh, our work is not that visible. Um, our thesis is that and Pied has done a lot of work. Energy is really not a governor's problem, but it's a problem of centralization. And that's one thing that I think I'd like your comment on. Ki, uh, we've seen through many decades, hmm. go back to for example, when I was in the powers uh, in the planning commission, power secretary used to run everything, mm -hmm. and then later on, up the power secretary is the principal accounting officer. Yeah. So, if the power secretary is the principal accounting officer, why not ask him who is responsible? And disco jo hai, disco ke boards, for example, I just googled again disco boards. Abhi recently, disco boards pe AGP ne report diye ke badi I removed the disco boards. I also didn't remove, I removed this civil service of disco boards. Now, there's a duality. Who is responsible? Is the disco board responsible for the disco? Or is the power secretary responsible for the disco? Or is the power minister responsible? So a lot of the problem is that there is a power minister. There is NEPRA. Who is responsible for the sector? Is NEPRA regulating the sector? Or is the power secretary re regulating the sector? In fact, Abdonas Nech Hordi, a long time ago, ADB and the World Bank used to insist that the tariff should be announced by the 
Nepra. Yeah. But now it's state. Now it's Nepra. So the question is the deeper governance issue is Kiji, are we really, do we really have a power system? I mean, you're going to talk to these petty bureaucrats, it's fair enough, but what independence do they have? Another thing that I noticed, and Shahid Sahib, you can confirm it, that all DISCO funds are sent to the finance, uh, to power ministry immediately. They don't keep any funds. They can't take any funds vis-a-vis. -vis. They can't take any decisions vis-a-vis -vis updating their infrastructure or doing better stuff. All these decisions are taken by the power sector. Do you see that as a problem? Because we said that it's a big problem. There is there's a great point there that you say that it's a problem of centralization, right? But what I'd like to, to do really is link that back to the earlier comment about keep politics away. It's centralized because it is political, right? And and you can, if you wanted to talk about the decentralization of the power sector, which is an option I'm very open to. I see a lot of benefits in taking that approach, right? However, right, it has to come with exactly these kinds of things that you were then talking about, including changing the cash flow structure, right? Changing the making structure so that where are subsidies born? Who's paying for subsidies, for example? Um, and... Uh, comes with, for example, the independence of disco boards, right? Are the disco boards independent? The answer is no, and they have not been, and they have not, they are not allowed to be, right? So in the recent effort that was done to try and combat losses, the one that's ongoing, the, the comments of uh, Secretary Power uh, were that, you know, basically, right? You know, how are you doing this? Meaning, you know, there's a police officer, there's a IB officer, there are other sort of officers. Ijlal, there Ijlal, sorry, for, sorry for coming in, but this yeah. has been done. This has been done by power secretaries. I remember Nargis did That's it. Right. I remember yeah. did it. I mean, is that the correct way to do it? I think, quite frankly, what we are looking for at Pine is, I and think what it's I think a lot of KG, ye jo hai na, ye cosmetic cheese. These are just things to sort of kind of uh, gain cheap popularity. The question is the rules of business. The rules of business say the principal accounting officer is the power secretary. He can interfere anywhere he likes, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a highly centralized system. He appoints the boards. It's a highly centralized system. Boards are mostly ex-civil servants or current civil servants or their 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 whatever cronies. So I think quite frankly, this has to be recognized up front. A power division takes all the decisions with regard to the power sector. There is stuff if you talk to the chairman Nepra Wajayani, ex-chairman Nepra. I think this is an important consideration that should come out in any analysis. Ki we really don't have a power system. We can keep talking about anecdotes, but where is the power system? Who initiated the coal plant? We didn't. Who initiated it? Sorry? It was not initiated. The coal plant in 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 um, um, wherever was, Taiwan, right? Now, uh -huh. who initiated? I mean, technically mm -hmm. speaking, look, mm -hmm. the planning division and the and the I've been a minister. Ministers have no power to initiate these things. Civil servants initiated. So come on, we have to put the buck where it is. No, and you do but right. What, what you're what you're talking about is a central is a system that is decentralized not only in this technical capacity it will never be decentralized unless it becomes politically decentralized in the same way you have to depart from an entire political structure which this centralization serves right i tied it to the symbolic idea of pakistan as a unitary state i think these things go together if you have this singular vision this is how this singular uh, uh sort of structure works and, and it corresponds that it then uh, reports to the power ministry. I'm not saying that that's good. I'm saying that what you're asking for, and it it is, I, I think, um, wishful thinking to say that politics will go away. It doesn't happen unless the politics support uh, that kind of uh, um, uh, a move. And, and it's a big move. It's not a small one in the least. And uh, the the ways in which these peripheral tensions uh, exist, if you uh, uh, sort of you have to, there's so much to disentangle if you were to take that approach. It, it's not a small shift at all. And to commercialize each of these entities has been the push from you know at least the 1992 uh, power sector privatization strategy, which drove the IPP program and everything else like that. It's always been about commercializing and then hopefully privatizing 
uh, the different discos. And that approach, like people still talk about privatization of discos as if it will help something, but honestly, the only ones for which they would be a buyer are the ones that are already functional. Ooh, who's going to want to buy and and you know or take over the sort of the, you know pesco uh, and that sort of uh, system but there's very little benefit to the state of privatizing the already you know relatively functional uh, distribution companies All right good point uh, may i may i just um, uh, bring another fact to life uh, the nepra act allowed the regulator a little bit of it, autonomy in setting tariffs mm -hmm. and setting standards and this and that. Mm -hmm. They then amended it to uh, uh, make it subservient to a national electricity plan. Now, the national electricity plan, then uh, last month, they came up with rules under the national electricity plan, and especially rule five, which binds the NEPRA to follow the national electricity plan to the last uh, PESA, i.e., whatever they determine uh, has to be implemented by NEPRA. Uh, mm. I, I think, uh, you know, we are regressing into, um, you know. Um, yes, sir, please uh, tell us what is the National Economic Plan? It's the national, on, uh, gee, it, it's, it's a bureaucracy, it's a CPPAG, NTDC, and so on. These people get together and they make a national electricity plan which is made for five years. It's approved by the uh, cabinet and the CCI, and NEPRA has been made to, uh, you know, uh, uh, has been, it, uh, it overrules everything NEPRA ever could have done or should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what's happening, even in these circumstances, on the one hand, they are saying that. They're going to go for CTBTM, which is the opening up of the market, allow B2B contracts and so on. Uh, on B2B contracts, I'd also like to sort of bring uh, this thing to four, that they've asked for 27 rupees uh, per kilowatt hour to wheel one unit of electricity. Um, and you add to that any generation cost, uh, which means that there can be no B2B contract in Pakistan. Uh, then they also have another rule, which is that if you want to leave the grid uh, and uh, start your own generation or wheel electricity from anywhere, uh, the first year you're going to be charged 100% of the cross-tariff and the uh, cross-tariff subsidies as well as the standard costs and so on. And for five years, it will keep going down on a reducing balance basis. So effectively, they've made you captive for life. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if you leave the grid and you are, uh, you cannot, I mean, uh, they will still keep charging you. Then they've done another thing, and uh, which is uh, they've introduced something known as MDI, 50% of the capacity that is installed in your premises, you will be charged uh, the fixed charges for that, irrespective of whether you use anything or not. Hmm. Um, these are things... Now, who... Uh, Chad, who so hang on, just one second. Lal Sahib, tell me, who comes up with these ideas? Surely this can't be political. Or is it political? No, the grid is dying otherwise. Hmm. Lal Sahib, tell me. You mean the idea to bring uh, the industrial the consumers back into the grid or tie them to the grid? No, there are so many no, crazy no, no. ideas. What Chai has talked no, about. No, so it's, the first, no, the first thing is that they have, um, uh, you know, nullified any freedom that uh, NEPRA had. I ah, mean, that NEPRA is, is now That's fully... obviously political, right? I mean, it's saying about how you want the country to run. It's talking about enforcing a centralized decision-making structure that allows the executive and the people who drive the executive to make decisions that the regulator is bound to. I mean, to me, that's explicitly political. It's about a vision about how the country should operate. I mean, that's, I think, a direct interpretation of that but sequence please. of events. Absolutely. And, and uh, but, but then, uh, I mean, as we discussed a long time ago, in 2010 or 2011, if you remember mm -hmm. Israel Saab and if you remember Nadeem Saab, we mm -hmm. didn't need an EPRA, we just needed a calculator or we needed a laptop. Uh, 
and uh, we have now effectively turned okay. nepra into a laptop theek hai ji let's take afia afia go ahead just to add ke uh, behind all this uh, new electricity plan and ctbcm it is not uh, about the politics or the government uh, donors are behind all these things और आई एग्री डेट नेपरा हैज बिकम ओनली अ कैलकुलेटर क्योंकि ओवर द ईयर नेपरा हैज नॉट वर्क ऑन इट्स कैपेसिटी और नेपरा इट्स जो मर्जी उनके जो फॉर्मर चेयरमैन कहते रहे बट दे हैव नॉट बिल्ड द कैपेसिटी ओवर द ईयर्स दे आर सेटिस्फाइड विद व्हाट दे आर डूइंग क्यों जी लाल साहब ये डोनर्स का रोल नहीं आपने मेंशन किया बिल्कुल तो वेल आउट ऑफ योर एनालिसिस नहीं 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 देयर इन देयर इन द एनालिसिस एंड द डोनर्स आर अ बिग पार्ट ऑफ इट बिकॉज़ द डोनर्स are very central to the formulation of these plans and ideas the 1992 power sector strategy that i mentioned was you know very consistent with world bank and usa thinking at the time uh in fact pakistan's power policy was one of the leading sort of power deregulation policies of the early 90s and that model was spread um elsewhere others implemented it better than we did uh but you know that uh, that model of privatization unbundling deregulation that was very much what the world bank was was pushing at the time world bank and adb and others have have been uh big players in this we haven't mentioned the imf yet either because the imf is very focused on the fiscal impact of the of the power sector it consistently has talked about reducing different forms of subsidies in order to ensure that more revenue um is raised through the sector or to try and push the government uh uh to do that so the donors have been present consistently throughout but i think one important aspect of it and i think well both shahid sahab and deen sahab might be able to comment on this but the the leadership level i would say has not always been um opposed to the vision pushed forward by donors if we simplify the donor led vision of what an effective power sector should be it's about eliminating subsidies it's about sort of a market oriented approach it's about sort of efficient and effective wheeling charges and a deregulated privatized uh sector with an effective uh, nepra style regulator right that's been i think the broad pattern of what um uh, the donors have have sought and has had a lot of support from within the pakistani leadership no no absolutely correct uh the donors uh, broadly speaking have been pushing for an open transparent and a market based power system uh but what has uh, happened in its place is that when we had the splitting up of papta uh mm. you did not follow through with the uh, additional steps that were necessary to be taken yeah. uh and then subsequently the power bureaucracy managed to subvert or to change things to uh, uh, be able to keep extracting whatever they could on a personal basis uh, basically that's the that's the story there's nothing else thick thick dear lal sir any last comments just wouldn't have put so much uh, sort of blame on the power bureaucracy necessarily a lot of people had made a lot of money from the power sector um and it it's certainly not just them <laughs> ipbs mm. yeah. देखिए पॉइंट बड़ा सिंपल है आईपीपीज जो है आईपीपीज इज अ डोनर थिंग एंड आई डिडंट आई डोंट हियर द माय माय प्रॉब्लम इज बेसिकली लेट मी से इट लाल साहब माय प्रॉब्लम इज कि वी वी डू दिस एनालिसिस एज इफ द एक्टर्स इन द सिस्टम वी टॉक अबाउट पॉलिटिकल इकॉनमी बट देन पॉलिटिकल इकॉनमी बिकम्स समथिंग दैट इज जस्ट पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ द आर्मी बट वी देयर आर नो अदर एक्टर्स इन द गेम फॉर एग्जांपल द ब्यूरोक्रेसी सीम्स टू बी टोटली एब्सेंट ब्यूरोक्रेसी हैज नो um negotiating power which i find very strange at the same time um, you know the donors have no negotiating power donors are not just this they also give the ipps and then also the the point is that the donors also back the bureaucracy into keeping the centralized system going to me the mm-hmm. biggest problem is the centralized system i mean mm-hmm. for example it also we did one reform which i wrote about a long time ago before probably your time ke ji banking system mara gaya tha and how did our banking system change that by accident nawaz sharif appointed shaukatri and i talked to shaukatri in a lot about it and i remember when shaukatri ran to khair i won't go into personal history the point is shaukatri for some strange reason got extreme independence and nawaz sharif got sick of him, sick of him after a year but shaukat managed to change the system how did he change the system 
He changed the board. He changed the senior management in less than three months. He brought in all the city bankers. The boards were changed. Boards were totally independent of Nawaz Sharif. Mm -hmm. Then he made the necessary changes. Then came two or three other guys and the banking system was changed. It's that kind of reform that we need in the power sector. But the problem is we cannot hire a single you know, professional into the power sector. They will not mm -hmm. allow a single professional to be hired into the power sector. They will not allow the boards to be changed at all. And once mm -hmm. the boards are changed, for example, I remember when I changed the boards, I even got into the situation where we said, okay, let's appoint CEOs. I asked the boards to appoint CEOs. We got some things going and they stopped the CEOs from being appointed. That's we right. went to Zatari, the president. The president said it will be done in two days. It wasn't done. So I right. think this this thing that we keep up the that analysts seem to have a have a view that bureaucracy has no agency at all that surprises me. Uh, despite all evidence, we seem to think that bureaucracy has no agency and that somehow the politicians do everything. Whereas the rules of business say that the principal accounting officer is the bureaucrat. Without mm -hmm. his signature, the whole plant could not be set up. Without mm -hmm. his signature, the whole system cannot run. The principal accounting officer is not the minister. The minister cannot do anything. So unfortunately, until we rectify the system, where we understand where the buck stops, Bhatni Manti, and that's something that your last comment, then we'll close. Uh, just one, one one thing. You see, one other mm -hmm. thing uh, that uh, uh, the way the system is set up, uh, yeah. and uh, Ijlal is very much aware of that as well, that mm -hmm. uh, any attempts to uh, modify the system to allow uh, tech-based solutions uh, have been blocked at one level or the other. Uh, and uh, therefore, we have no smart meters. We don't have uh, 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 high voltage uh, distribution. We don't ha have sheets distribution. I mean, the, all these things have been tried and tested. But we even have... We prepared a whole um, system, which we the billing system. Billing mm -hmm. system is the heart of the problem. We prepared uh -huh. a PC. We prepared a PC one, which said that the billing system could decentralize kare, and every company will have its own billing system and smart meters. Aega. That PC one was sent to the power secretary, but it has never been tabled. So I mean, they have an agency. You can say agency is not there. I think no, no, that I, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't say that the agency is not there. But I think that we need to understand that the way that they can act is. Uh, shaped and influenced by the, the the other actors. They're one part of. Uh, they're they're one set of actors among several. You know, some are the politicians, some are the army, some are the donors, some are some are others. And I think the example of Karachi Electric, which we haven't talked about today, is instructive because you know Karachi Electric's rather you know startling transformation. It happens within a singular context. Karachi is quite different, I think, from much of the rest of Pakistan. But one thing that happens that I think is absolutely essential to Karachi Electric making the progress that it did was the end of the Liari gang war, the operations around sort of 2011, 2012, that the face of Karachi changes at that point in time. And Karachi Electric becomes able to operate in a manner which it could not operate previously. And nothing analogous to that has happened in the rest of the country, that the way that public systems operate in general is quite consistent. And so, you know, no matter how smart or capable or well-intentioned a singular secretary is, that's a shortfall of the centralized system, is that they cannot enforce at a very local level, uh, on a sustained basis, the kind of reforms that I think they want to take uh, hold. Ijinal, just one uh, final thank question Thank you very much. Me. No, and one you. final question from me. Which is, right. uh, we have this centralized system in electricity. Why don't we have such a centralized system in gas? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, it, it's uh, surprising. And because of that, uh, and because of the huge pricing differentials between the two energy sources, we have huge arbitrage opportunities which have been exploited. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I... I but that's a source of 
that's 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 the subject of another webinar bilkul theek aap keh rahe hain that's absolutely correct and we have discussed that and we will discuss that you know we discuss both energy and gas a lot and unfortunately i think quite frankly i think uh, to close i'll just simply say ke i think we still remain very uh, unsure of our yeah, analysis in the system because quite frankly at the heart ajlal is a centralized colonial system at work still yep. and whether I you like the dc and the ac and the, that system is a centralized skeleton in the system that controls a lot that does control a lot they control cities they control energy they control everything but and i think the uh, sense of the scale of the response that's required uh, dr sab dr sab do you remember that uh, there was a demand by the uh, all the uh, donors that please shut down petco and mm. there were written statements <laughs> given by each mm. and every administration that petco is dead we've killed it we've killed it we've killed it we can, petco, actually we can. petco and yeah petco back. is still alive petco is still the, alive the problem is ki ye jo decision making a system hai na at the heart of it the agency dis- distributed i'm not saying any one person is responsible right. but i'm saying there interaction that we need to understand and most often we ignore the interaction by just saying either it's political or it's civil military or something but there's a deeper interaction that are going on all the time for example uh, the, um, um, the the other element is the get get free electricity all kinds of issues that work here it takes a very complex system but uh-huh. at the heart of the problem that we need these and but thank you very much ajlal very informative study very good you created a great I, i'll get the book and many copies of software Please do. Inch, uh, we'll keep in touch. Andy. When you come to uh, to Islamabad, be a guest at Pied. Okay, we'd with, love with to pleasure, have. With pleasure, with pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much.